you will not find it difficult to prove that battles, campaigns, and even wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics. General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Three decades ago, on the 5th of April, 1993, five army corps merged to form the Royal Logistic Corps, establishing a world-class, innovative, adaptable corps, sustaining the army and wider defense at home and overseas as the core component of a global, integrated logistic enterprise. My formation day was slightly different to everybody else's. Uh, we were a small detachment, we were around about 25 to 30 of us. On the parade day itself, we basically paraded outside, uh, all formed up, uh, where the CO of the regiment came down and awarded us our cap badges. Uh, from there, we were carted off to Fallon Boston where we had a formation evening. It was really good. It was a case of, you know, we were all in the hangar. We played the movie uh, of, of the different trades. So we all cheered and sung. Uh, we then jumped back on the bus and then carried on the party back in the camp. We are the ROC now. Let's just get on and do the best we can and just carry on our trade. We you know we'd, we'd formed to the new logistic corps and we were based in Abingdon and we went up to Perbright for the formation parade. We practiced drill for three or four days. Um, unfortunately, on the day of the parade when Prince Hassan was visiting, we had to change the front rank because there was a slight altercation in the bar the night before with the Pioneer Corps and the, Corps and the Transport Corps. So that was quite uh, challenging for the Corps of Seven at the time, changing around personnel. And for me personally, it was a great day because Princess Anne, I was the first transport member that she, that she, that she talked to. Just like I am now, I stuttered quite a lot. Um, and I was known as M M M Mac for quite a while. So yes, it was a, a quite a momentous day to be part of uh, the formation. So my um, Troop Commanders course was the first um, male and female course to commission into the RLC. Um, obviously the Corps came into being in April uh, 93 and we commissioned uh, that August. Um, and uh, I've known no different really, so straight into the RLC. Um, I felt uh, certainly when I turned up in 10 Regiment, which was my first posting, I had the credibility of having done the same course as the men um, and commissioned into uh, a new corps and I didn't have any preconceptions of the, the forming corps. So one of the things I've been really grateful for, for being in the RLC is the opportunities it's given me. You know, I've deployed on operations uh, in command at every single rank and I'm the only woman in the army to have done that. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't been in the RLC. Uh, I was serving in 5 Airborne Brigade at 10 Airborne Workshops. So I went to speak to my boss and said, look, you know, I know we've got this parade going on on Monday, but, you know, I'd really appreciate it if, you know, I could uh, help out on the Red Devils 314. So I literally walked out the gates of 5 Airborne on the Monday morning um, with an REOC cap badge in. And, Went parachuting for the day, got back that evening and uh, everybody's got a different cap badge in and, you know, the parade had gone ahead. Very low-key affair at five, I have to say. It was literally just get on parade, berries on, berries off, and everybody went back to work. Um, and, and then it started to grow. I, I just thought it was progress. You know, you could see it, you could see that amalgamation. Didn't have too many hang-ups about it. I just thought, you know, this is the, these are the cards that have been dealt. Let's just get on with it and, you know, embrace the new core. This was the start of a stormy 30 years for the British Army. Yet at every turn, every conflict, every deployment, at home and overseas, would not have been possible without the RLC, cutting its teeth in the likes of Bosnia and Northern Ireland. Evolution of skill and expertise has shaped the successes of the RLC. Now 16 trades of highly qualified, experienced and passionate people. The regiment's deployment was all over the Bosnia and Herzegovina in the former Yugoslavia. So from the port where you would have all the supplies from the audience and then all the, the transport squadrons were, were dotted around. So the driving conditions were very treacherous and uh, long uh, driving tasks of 18, 19 hours of putting on and off snow chains. My main responsibility was fuel for that, t that operational tour. So driving, you know, a 50 ton, vehicle with snow chains on through hazardous conditions, it's, it's still one of the most hazardous places I've been um, with the Corps and the Army. You know, very early on in Bosnia, uh, you know, I remember being in Sipovo, which is where the, 
the brigade headquarters was and also in Sipovo was the uh, fire support company and 100 metres uh, across a football pitch was the log brigade support squadron and I often cite the RLC as being 30 years ahead of its time in diversity by purely what I would see on a morning. You could stand uh, in the middle of the football pitch and on your left hand side was the battle group and on your right hand side was a brigade support squadron and there were four shower quarry mechs for each and in the battle group you had one shower quarry mech, entire quarry mech for two women. So if you looked right you saw four quarry mechs of equal lines because there was men and women in the queues, I mean you could close the doors. Uh, and you know that's that's 25 years ago uh, and nobody bothered about it you know you just you just did your job it didn't matter what you know what, what your gender was and I was lucky enough on my second tour of seven transport regiment uh, to go on the last of banner tour in Northern Ireland as well which was an interesting time again there was certain times certainly the, the the 12th the glorious 12th as they call it out there that was a time when there was trouble uh, and we were there just to aid the police. We had the infantry in the rear. We drove them to where they needed to be. We then set up the base lines uh, and let the infantry do what they needed to do. Yeah, so uh, East Timor was in 1999. I do remember vividly getting a call at kind of 5.30, 6 o'clock at night in the science mess to say, can you pop into work, we need a chat. And uh, I was literally travelled north, picked up my passport and I was on the plane out to Australia the next morning. So it was about as rapid as a deployment gets. From a British contingent point of view, we sent uh, two RGR and a debt from the Special Boat Service. Uh, and they needed somebody to go out and do the logistic assistance. From memory, I think there were four or five other RLC out there at the time, so I think we deployed two movers. We certainly had two postal and courier staff. The logistic challenges were the hardest part, so you've got a limited amount of airframes, and then you've got to try and get equipment from... The Australian Army were the only military support that we had really on the mainland, so you are doing LRS at its rawest. Um, we had everything. I mean, we had two RGR there, so I remember we were literally identifying their dietary requirements, you know, so ration packs in the early days, and then it was a case of, right, how can we enhance this? Being able to buy, you know, food which was more country specific, you know, the reception and, and the morale that that brings. Um, that would not happen without a logistician. I've, I've often thought this, I've often thought, you know, what would have happened if I had gone to the infantry or, or you know, any other random thing? And there is no way that it would have had the variety um, and the characters that I've had the opportunity to meet. You know, the core's incredibly diverse. You know, we're big, so we get diversity, but we also mix with everybody. At the end of the first decade, an event that would change the world and the nature of conflict shaped the next period of the RLC commitment, September the 11th. The Corps entered a continuous era of kinetic activity overseas at this time in history, with Iraq and Afghanistan serving as the two principal theatres of war. This infant yet world-class professional corps enabled the British Army to conduct at reach and in-depth operations, while functioning in some of the most inhospitable and hazardous situations of the conflicts. My first operational tour was um, Headache 19, 2014-2015, uh, um, as part of 2 Battalion Rimi. A very long tour, nine months tour, um, very challenging and emotional, a very busy tour. I was required as, as part of my team to reduce the theatre ES material account from 12,000 line items to 1,100. Seeing that Bastion was being collapsed um, and losing that basic facility that we had, it is the close down, the close down was, was sad in a way, but fulfilling that we've done, we've done what we were supposed to do. And, and seeing it go slowly, I think is something that we'll always remember. So I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan. I did Telic 10 with four rifles. And that's one I'll never forget. We were just finishing, finishing off prep and we went, let's go and have a board brief. So we stood by the board and just going through everything and then next the ceiling falls in because Basra Palace had been hit. And you do think, oh, hang on a minute, did, did that just happen? You're, you're kind of all over the place. But everybody was just 
right, hands on. Let's 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 see if there's any injuries. And um, it's just one thing that stays with me because there was a comment made by somebody that you know chefs chefs wouldn't get injured, uh, chefs don't experience the negative, and that was a prime example of actually yes we do, and we still had to crack on and get dinner ready. That takes character. That takes strength because seeing something like that is not something you see every day. So to be able to just brush ourselves off, get back in the kitchen and do what we are trained to do is awesome. I suppose my my overriding memories of, uh, you know, operational deployments are, you know, just how professional our soldiers are under fire. The composure, um, you know, and the discipline, the sheer professionalism to, 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 to really pull together to do, to do a really good job. You know, we're close knit teams anyway, but you know, that's just that's just magnified in operations. And you know, to watch it, to watch it un unfold, you know, when people are, you know, under contact um, and how it all clicks together, uh, you know, is, is really amazing. We iced our cake in Afghanistan without a doubt and, and brought ourselves right to the forefront and showed people exactly what we were capable of. And I think now that any military commander now coming through, all, all of the new, you know, blood that, that's coming into those infantry regiments and that's commanding at the top levels, they've learned from that experience and they understand that we, you know, just how important logisticians are. There's, there's not a great deal of fondness in Afghanistan, as you, uh, as you will appreciate, but I think it was just that ability to know that you're making a difference, you know, to make sure, you know, everybody who's who's served out there has had quite a challenging time. And I remember vividly, I think on my 40th birthday, just helicoptering into Inkerman and it was getting a little bit lively thinking, what am I doing here? This is just not <laughs> the best place uh, for me to be right now. But again, you know, you can be a 40 year old out there, but when you're surrounded by young lads who are all looking at you and expecting you to be, you know, that kind of, steady ship and the face of experience um, you can't really show that you've got any trepidation or weakness so uh, you just got to get on with it sometimes unfortunately. We as a small team just three of us I was the uh, officer at the time and I had a staff sergeant and a corporal with me both from the corps uh, both very capable operators um, they would go into that environment and they would engage at various levels and work out exactly what needed to be doing and also the people back in UK desperate for information as to how we could then, you know, enhance logistics because we were looking to roll out another four or five teams on the back of me and then that was going to become um, the legacy of the Corps working in Afghanistan. But in, in terms of what we were able to achieve there, because we were able to offer some degree of governance and just to calm things down and make people really think about the priority for getting equipment in, um, we did professionalised logistics at first line. Uh, I don't think there's many infantry battle groups that would argue that they've not benefited from that significantly over the years. In the first two decades, the Royal Logistic Corps qualified all over the world, establishing itself as the industry pioneer in military logistics and solidifying its position as the British Army's enablers. The core third decade has been heavily overshadowed by two pivotal moments in world history. Each saw the RLC come into their own and surpass. The first was Operation Pitted, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Second, COVID-19, the global pandemic, which had the British Army mobilize on home soil on Operation Rescript. I deployed on um, Op Ruman uh, back in September 2017. Uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma in the Caribbean islands and the U.S. So we deployed within 48 hours to set up a logistics node at Barbados Airport uh, to support the disaster relief uh, reconstruction efforts was huge. We were receiving over 15 A400 or C-17 flights with pallets of stores um, realigned and repositioned into various lanes to go and support um, so we had no time. We were working on 12-hour shift. Uh, that was the most challenging. Um, and the weather, being very hot at the time, uh, contributed. It was a factor. Uh, but the most important thing was to get on with the job. Um, it was a short, short tour, but tour that needed to achieve a lot to make sure the lives 
and the welfare of the people were returned at least back to some form of normality. So that is a pride, I think. Being one of the only uh, dangerous goods consigner and moving around the islands on a daily basis or flying uh, on, a, on an A400 to go to various islands, uh, meeting people and seeing their smiles on their face that they've seen us coming into their aid and helping them out, I think, you know, put a shining light on my face. Uh, I've deployed operationally to Afghanistan on Ot Pitten. Uh, to be selected to go out there it was quite an honour because there was only about six of us that went out there um, to start with and it was, yeah, it was a really good feeling. At the time I was, was kind of like excited because that's all you want to do in the army, you want to go away, go do stuff. But at the same time, like you've seen it on the news and that, it was kind of, kind of scary in a way. Our job out there was to be able to supply everyone with the food, water, with basically anything that you could survive with. Um, and to do that, you were, we had to use um, vehicles that we found. You could see, you know, people wouldn't have survived. People wouldn't have had water, wouldn't have food. And you, you see everyone, especially when you was out there, you saw them all crying for water, crying for that, and you just give it out kind of thing and little especially like little kids who come up you know and, and all they want is a little bit of water a little bit of like a blanket or something you know it's an amazing feeling being able to say you've saved someone's life you know people join the army to do stuff like that and to say you've actually done it it, it shows it's very you could be very proud of it kind of thing I think some of the hardest things I saw out there was when we had to watch the funeral of the Americans that um, died in the blast. And, you know, it kind of comes home because you're like, that could have been me, that could have been my friend, it could have been anyone, you know. We were on stag, so I think, I, if I recall at the moment, I was on stag. Um, you heard him, and, and I think the majority of the thing was like, are our lads that are out there, are they safe? It was just very strange at the end, especially when there was like two nations left, which was also in America. It was very weak, so it had gone very quiet. You know, and you go in there and you, the Taliban are gonna take over the next day, and you know as soon as they're gone, that's it, they're like, gone. So it came over the radio that there was eight um, Taliban that were inside and they were looking to um, to shoot us. <laughs> And it's the first time, I mean, you do training over and over again, but it's the first time you get to that position and you're like, right, this <laughs> might be doing something here. I'd been in the army for about four years by the time I'd got there. I mean, there were people out there coming with us who would, the only exercise they'd done was phase one. <laughs> and they're telling us and you're like, but do you But then that kind of puts you, because you've been a little bit longer, got a little bit more experience, you kind of like, right, you know, you'll be all right kind of thing. And then once you're out there, you're out there, it's not gonna change, you know, so you kind of, your outlook goes, you know, you go as your day to day to work, but you just be a little bit more careful. And obviously you've got stag on it as well, you know. Definitely with like people who had been over there before, I mean, they've they've worked in fighting the Taliban and now they're working with the Taliban. Like, for me, you know, it was just, the way it was, but for them, when people have lost people and that from fighting through them, it's just strange. Like, it really took home, like, like what I was doing out there, why I was doing it. You know, I was helping them to be able to get out, and you could see how desperate they were. So, of Rescript, we we were there in Wales to try and help with the the pressures that they were under, and they they didn't have enough. Um, personnel to cover the amount that they were de being demanded. So we drove the ambulances and we basically did the, the job that a, their um, technician, the medical technician would do. You know, we went into the patients' houses and we did their vital signs, their, you know, did the checks on them that they needed to do. You know, just help them as if a normal crew would. Um, so it was, it was a lot more than driving and it's known as, oh, you went to drive for ambulances, but it, you did a lot more than that. We was about to finish a, a shift one night and we got a call on the radio for a, a red call, but there wasn't enough ambulances. 
Um, so we radioed in saying we'd, we'd work extra time, you know, because there was someone that needed help. 25 year old um, male had been on a quad bike and he'd not seen a farmer's fence that had just been put up. He'd hit it and he'd, he'd basically like crushed him from head to toe. His skull was detached from his face, um, so his ribs were crushed. Um, so when you were doing CPR, like you couldn't, it was just he could, it was like a bag of stones, his chest, um, and he was only 25, and it was sad to see because you kind of knew that he wasn't coming back from that, just to look at him. You know, in years to come to say that I was part of that, and I helped, I helped do that, because it was all over the news, so, and everyone knew about it, so, I'm, yeah, I'm proud to say that I was part of that and I helped. The Royal Logistic Corps goes from strength to strength in the 21st century. Combat service support is at the cornerstone of every British Army operation, from conflicts in the Middle East to delivering vital humanitarian aid abroad to supplies here in the UK. Uh, David Kitching, um, he's quite new. He did a year at Harrogate, um, and he's now currently serving at Chippenham as a petroleum operator um, for the last year, nearly a year now. We were walking back to the car. He said, Dad, you were in the RLC. I'm now in the RLC. I'm going to get to W02 because you only got to Staff Sergeant. Uh, my wife uh, joined the RLC in 2001 uh, as a reservist. So if you think about it, between my wife, my son and myself, we've actually all got uh, together, combined, we've actually got 30 years of raw logistics or service. I said that uh, I've got to get to W02 now only because he got up to a Staff Sergeant during his time within the RLC. So yeah, just a bit of a competition really. Um, a lot of it uh, was obviously due to my parents both being in the ROC, so I grew up around it. So they were obviously a big influence, but um, also they just had a trade I wanted to do. It's, it's quite a good feeling to be honest, because obviously now I get to carry on what they sort of started. Obviously with the RLC being 30 years old, it's a lot younger than other cause, and they've all got history and it's nice to be a part of making being part of the future of the RLC and you know creating traditions that maybe have not yet been made and carrying on like past traditions from when it was formed. The the biggest thing that like Pitting will have on my career in the future is definitely like experience. You know I've I've been out there, I've tried it and it's crazy and I've really enjoyed it and I want to use that moving on and to be able to be part of more things in the future that is as big as what Pitting was. That's what they want to do, that's want to be part of the history and it's nice to be part of it as well. Someone who formed, helped form um, the RLC, um, I think they'd be glad to, to know that the RLC was still doing good things and keeping the reputation up. Um, anyone who would, who would help to form a, a core would, would be glad to know that. We are the RLC. This is the age of the logistician, and we sustain. <laughs>